the home buying process and dealing with some of the partnerships and the partners that we do. Um, that's just something we've come up with. I mean, some, a lot of them, they do have some good programs, but they're, they're specific to their, uh, to their, you know, their group only. So what we're trying to do is just broaden this out a little bit more and offer this to everybody. Cause there's a lot of different, you know, a lot of different partners that we have in, in the, uh, in the real estate um, arena here. And that's what we want to kind of do is just bring some of this together. These are just a few of the people, a few of the groups that we, uh, that we deal with and there'll be more, <clears throat> obviously I couldn't put them all on here, but this is, uh, this is just enough, just what we're going to get started today. Okay. All right. And, and what this is, what you're, what you're attending today, this is, uh, we call this your gateway to profit sharing home buying. This is a mini workshop. Uh, we probably will expand this to a one day program uh, on location, but that's in the works right now. And we'll, we'll, um, we'll get your feedback too, as we, uh, after we, we complete this. So this is a unique opportunity for home buyers, investors, neighborhood organizations to gain essential knowledge and insights related to profitable home ownership. And it provides you with practical guidance, value re valuable resources, and an accessible learning platform to empower you on your journey towards successful home ownership. Disclaimer, um, we're not giving you any kind of financial advice. We're here to help you and kind of uh, kind of get you to, to see, see uh, some of the aspects and some of the things that are very important. Uh, but we're not really giving you any specific advice that we do recommend you do all your own due diligence as you move forward, just like we do with, with your investments. All right. Three essential steps to acquiring the home of your dreams. This is what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> First of all, the neighborhood. We're going to talk about the neighborhoods and what to look for and what's right for you. We all have an individual um, situation and that's you're going to just have to see what it is for you. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes here. Next is the money. Of course, we got to have money. And um, we're going to talk about some of the things you're going to need, what's uh, important, and some of the things that uh, you'll have to get together as far as getting pre-approval and, um, and getting the financing. Partners, we're going to talk about partnerships. There are professionals uh, in the real estate um, arena that we're going to need to deal with. You're going to need some, not all of them, uh, but we will... <clears throat> we were going to talk about some of these and we're also going to have some ways moving forward that you can know what to look for and, and what to do here. All right. First of all, let's talk a little bit about choosing your neighborhood. Okay. If this is done, like I said, kind of on an individual basis, uh, what is your, your family uh, situation like? How many maybe children do you have? How many people do you, are in your household? Sometimes you're uh, Sometimes you have other family members that live with you. Sometimes you have partners. There's a lot of different situations these days. Uh, how many bedrooms are you going to need? How many, you know, uh, how many rooms are you going to need? Are you going to need something? Do you run a business out of your house? I mean, there's a lot of factors to consider, and it's all done kind of on an individual basis. And again, uh, you, you're going to look at schools. If you do have children, uh, what 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 different schools do they go to? If there's any private schools, what your work situation is? Are you you're going to need to commute? Um, we're going to walk to work. Is uh, public transportation how important is that to you? Um, recreation. I mean, there's some places now that where you you want to um, I don't know a, a skateboard park for your kids or I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff. Is a pool important? is um, um, maybe for things like your, you know, pets. Is it pet friendly? That's that's a consideration these days. How many pets can you have? Can you run a, a dog mill out of your house? Um, senior communities, do, is it, how important is it to you to have, maybe you want to live close to your aging mother or father uh, or a family member, and you might need to have some senior activities. You might be working during the day. It might be important for you to have something close by that where they could have some activities. Um, and just different amenities. That's some of the things you're going to look for. Um, and then a very big consideration these days is your 
HOAs, POAs, PUDs, uh, what are their perks and restrictions now? HOAs is your homeowner associations. That's the one most people are familiar with. There's a lot of, of things. There's good and, and things that you need to be aware of too. Uh, same thing with the POAs, that's your property owner associations. And then your PUDs, that's your planned urban developments. Um, you don't hear that as much, but they are important to know because they're all these, there's a, uh, there's an organization for, uh, you know, a lot of organizations out there and you will need to pay attention to some of these uh, things because that that'll make all the difference. I know in some of the condo uh, con condominium uh, associations, I know recently we had, you know, they had, they had the, they raised our insurance. So they, they have a special assessment that they charged everybody for um, you know, and it's like an additional $3,500 that's not in your regular assessments. And that's just stuff you need to know about. Is that going to be important for you? Um, you're going to, you're just going to need to know that kind of stuff going into that. Is that going to be a big surprise? Is that something you can do? Okay. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, perks cause you get a lot of good stuff. They take care of the lawns. They, I mean, they may, they, they, you know, shovel the snow. There's just a lot of things that they do. They, you know, they're, they're the ones that keep your neighbors all in line. They keep the place looking good and groomed. And, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that they do a lot of good, I call them perks, but there are some restrictions too. Certain ones you cannot put, you, you can only put like certain flags out there. You can't put signs out there. If you're selling your place, except only on designated times. Like maybe if you're having an open house, you can only do that on Saturday and Sundays. You can't put signs out there the rest of the time. Garage sales, you can't necessarily have those, or maybe you can. Maybe they have a community garage sale once a, once a year. Um, there's just a lot of, a lot of things that you need to be aware of. Um, can you have, if you're, if you're an investor, can you rent this property? Okay. There's, uh, you know, that, that's a big consideration and you're going to want to check all that stuff out before you move into the neighborhood. Okay. That's very important. Um, and then city, county uh, regulations, um, and, and again, going back to things like um, maybe you want, maybe you work on cars and you're looking for a place that you found a place that has a nice garage out back and you're going to want to work on cars out there, just for example, but maybe the community will not let you. Maybe they will, depending on what you do. I know, um, I, I don't know, when I used to deal with cars a lot, it used to be like in the state of Missouri, you had to have, uh, if you if you bought and sold more than five cars per year, you had to have a dealer's license. I mean, these are some of the things that you want to know before you move into the neighborhood. And that's that's very important because you don't want to get there and then find out that you you can't um, do what, you know, what you're actually looking to do. Um there's just a lot of things like this that you need to know. One of the things I used to recommend, because it's something I did not do when I bought my first few houses, is I'll tell people when you find the ideal neighborhood, go there at different times, okay? Don't just go there with, uh, you know, if, if you're using a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, you know, real estate agent, don't just go there with them whenever they show you the house that's available. Drive up there in the evening, OK, after people get home from work, after the kids are home from school and just sit there and look around the neighborhood. Look if it's the kind of people you want to be around. Also, go on the weekends. That's very important. Uh, go Friday night. See if they're having big parties and just stuff that maybe you want or maybe you don't want to be around. I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of things that you want to be aware of as you're picking out your neighborhood. Then again, this is done on an individual basis. OK, because we all have a different situation. Same thing with, uh, you know, ev everything about buying the house is done on an individual basis. And that's something that only you could decide. Next is the uh, money needed. Of course, you're going to need some money. There's a lot of different um a lot of different things that's going to require money during the home buying process, whether you're by a first time home buyer, a second time home buyer or an investor. Um, you know, there's there's things that you're going to need money for. And we'll talk about a couple of those. How much can you afford? Well, that's the first thing you really want to look at. And you're, you're going to want to see and, and we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about the pre-approval process, but you're going to want to see what you can afford because um, there, there's a lot of things that, uh, that there's things you don't count on, too. We're going to talk about some of those here in a, in a few minutes. Um, but but how much can you afford? One of the things that they're one of the first things you're going to want to look for is your DTI or your 
debt to income ratio. And what that is in its simplest form is how much money do you have coming in and how much can you have going out towards your house? Now you are going to need to consider everything else too. Do you have a car payment or maybe student loans? And I mean, there's a lot of things or there's a lot of other things you could be making payments on that will be considered. But your debt to income ratio on your on your housing, it's usually it just it just depends. Now these change over the years. I've seen them as high as 50% during the subprime days. And usually they want they want you to stick to around 25, 26%, something like that, or maybe up to the 30, you know, mid-30 ranges. And again, that's going to depend on your personal situation. There's other factors involved, which we're not going to get into a lot of that today, but that will be part of your pre-approval process when you're working with your money person, who could be your mortgage broker or a couple other things we'll talk about here. But that's that's something you want to consider is your debt to income ratio. Once you get into this, they'll be talking about front end and back end. That just has to do with how much you have now and then things like taxes, insurance, and there's a, there's a few other factors too. But that's something you, you do need to be aware of. Um, what we used to tell people when I was a mortgage broker, a typical rule of thumb, and this is not, I mean, this is something to just for your own use, but we'd tell you it, it's about 1% of what the total is, what you're going to need per month to survive. This is not your debt to income ratio, but 1%, let's say so for every, let's say $100,000 the house costs, you're going to need about $1,000 per month. Okay, to survive in that house. So if you've got a two hundred thousand dollar house, you can count on about two thousand dollars a month. That is not what your payment's going to be or anything else, but that's about the money you're going to need besides everything else, just for just to have your house, uh, just to maintain your uh, your your living standard in that house. A um, couple things that we're going to look at here. Of course, your down payment. That's going to be that's going to depend on you. There's different programs out there. Um, that, you know, there's, there's anything from zero down up to, well, nowadays, especially with the, the way things have changed a little bit, they've tightened their belts. It could be, if you're looking at investment properties, it could be as high as 35%, 30, 35% is what I'm seeing on multifamilies right now in the last few weeks. I mean, that changes from time to time. That also depends on you, on your credit and a few other things, what your history is. Um, if you've got a good track record, that's going to make a difference. If you're a first time home buyer though, you, you know, there's ways you can qualify for a little bit lower down possibly um and again that's done on an individual basis insurance uh this is a thing i put I like to put this up front this is a lot of things that you know a lot of times people forget this kind of stuff you're going to need to pay a year's worth of insurance up front okay for whether you're a first time home buyer or an investor or second third time uh, whatever your case may be you're going to need to consider things like commissions Okay, is there real estate commissions involved, whether you have a buyer's or a seller's agent, there may be uh, as much as, uh, you know, 3% on each end as much as 6% I've seen, I've even seen some a little bit higher, depending on what that is. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, that's the seller's responsibility. Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, because there's different ways you can make your deals work. Uh, points. This is something. Uh, points. What those? What points are? Is um, that's just one percent of the loan amount. Sometimes you have origination uh, origination fees, which could include points. There's also ways to uh, to buy down these these points. I know one of the things we used to do uh, when I was a mortgage broker for somebody that was really tight on um, tight on their money. Um, they would have you know when you uh, when you're dealing with somebody, they still need to get paid, but they would have um, they, they would have like, they used to call it yield spread. I think they call it a couple other things, but basically what it is, if you could not, let's say afford a half a point or a point because your money was so tight, what they would do is that you would pay maybe a quarter percent, an eighth of a point or a quarter percent higher on your interest rate. So let's just say you qualified for an 8%, but you would pay an eight and a quarter percent that way. The money person, the broker, the banker would get paid for the transaction he did. So that's kind of how they would offset some of that kind of stuff. So that's just something that's a little bit deeper than what our scope is here today. But I just wanted you to be aware of some of that kind of stuff. Of course, closing costs, there are things that, that you're going to have to have. Even such things as when it comes down to it, you might have to pay for a credit report. Okay, there's a, of course, there's a, 
appraisals, inspections. There's a lot of other things. There's what they call prepays. You might have to pay some stuff up front. Reserves, a lot of times they will require you to have so many months uh, in reserves, okay? Um, a lot of times going into that, depending on what kind of loan program you qualify for, you might have to have three months worth of payments in reserves and sitting there before you get there. Seasoning is another thing, okay? You might have to have the money sitting there for 60 days or 90 days. Or, I mean, there's our, if you're getting it from, uh, you know, from, from somebody else, you might have to have a gift letter. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but seasoning requirements. They want to make sure you didn't go out and, I don't know, rob a bank the night before, or you're selling drugs or something like that. I mean, they want to know where, where the money's coming from. So it needs to be seasoned and they want to know the source. That's going to be something that you're going to probably have to verify. Um, Again, some more money Move in, moving in. Uh, you're going to have moving in expenses. You're going to have probably deposits, depending on your history, maybe with utility companies and some other things. We um, Occupancy permits, this is something you're probably going to have to have to, depending on where you're at. Most places these days, unless you're out in the country by yourself somewhere, you're going to have to have an occupancy permit. Uh, there's a lot of upfront costs. Um, after you move in, you're going to have home ownership, maintenance, and repairs. I mean, just the things you, there's a lot of things that we don't count on as being a homeowner or property owner even things like changing the filter in your air conditioner once a month or once a quarter depending on what kind of system and what you have um, if you have uh, you know there's just all kinds of things that's going to be ongoing also uh what happens if something breaks okay um well if you got some money in reserves you're going to be able to deal with this but what happens if like right now with this heat that we have going on what if your air conditioner breaks and you don't have the money to fix it that could be a real problem for you and your family. So that's just things you need to keep keep in mind as you're you're looking for money that you are going to need on an ongoing basis. And there are assistance programs available. They are very limited and there, rest there are restrictions. Now, this is done, again, on an individual basis, okay? There are a lot of good programs, though, depending on the neighborhood that you are looking at moving into uh, for you and your family. And there, and, and there are just uh, loan programs, too, that also offer some of this. There are federal programs and local programs. And I very much encourage you to seek these out and see what they are. Now, some of the restrictions are, if you use like like a gift program, you may or, or a assistance program, you may not be able to use gift money. And I mean, and, and there's not limited to that, but there's a lot of different things you need to know about. And that's where your money person will come in. And so um, as we talk a little bit more about getting pre-approval, that's some of the things you're going to want to check into when you go to look for money for your home. And then there's cash. Uh, cash is what most of us know, but there's also some sweat equity uh, programs available. We'll talk a little bit about this more uh, today. And if, if you're interested in finding out more, you can you can ask me about this after we're done. And I've, I've got some things we're, that we're looking at doing right now with some of our partners where you could actually be, whether you're a skilled laborer or not a skilled laborer, you could also add to this and you might be able to get some um, you know, get get some credit towards your home purchase through through the uh, the program here. So that's something you, you're definitely going to want to talk about or find out about um, after after this is uh, after we're done with this. All right, what about our profit sharing partners? All right, well, first of all, you're going to need a money person. Okay, this could be a mortgage lender, a broker, a banker, a loan officer. Um, or it could just be, uh, there's there's a lot of different sources for money out there. Most of us, especially first time home buyers, and even, even those of us that have been around for a while, do not have the cash to pay for all our uh, homes and our investments up front. Even if you're an investor and you have some pretty deep pockets, there's going to be a time when you're probably going to use up all your money, okay? And you're going to need to leverage it. One of the best things you can do is leverage it, where you put the least amount of money out of pocket. That's where you're going to need a money person, somebody that has money. There's plenty of money out there, but it has to be for the right situation. So you're going to, this is something that you're going to have to uh, have to have as you go, as you go along. 
All right. Some of the other partners we're going to have is real estate agent. There are buyers and sellers agents out there. Okay. The sellers agents, uh, you go, somebody's going to list their home and a lot of times they'll put it on the MLS. This is how you'll find some homes. Uh, there's a lot of off market properties um, that you can also, that will you know, maybe talk about a little bit here, but there are also is buyers agents. Okay. If you go to somebody and, and some of you might know some people that you go to the agent and they'll help you find some homes looking for the, through the different sources here. Um, most of the buyer's agents will require you to be pre-approved for your loan before they drive you and your kids and you know, all the stuff around town to look at homes. Okay. But, and it's not the, you know, that they want to be mean, but they, they don't want to waste their time just like they don't want to waste yours. So I always recommend you start off getting your, uh, yourself pre-approved for the loan. We'll talk more about some uh, some the checklist and qualifications here in a few minutes. Uh, but that's the real estate agent is probably where you're going to, most people are going to start. Okay. Home inspectors, you're going to want to know what the house uh, needs, doesn't need. You're going to know the want to know the condition of a lot of the appliances, the roofs, uh, foundation. I mean, there's just a lot of things. You're like with the roof, for example. Um, the insurance companies have tightened their belt lately in the last few years with all the storms and everything we've had going along. And they're they're prorating a lot of the roofs. It used to be if you bought a home then um and you had, you know, like a hail, a hail storm two years down the road they would just give you a new roof. It doesn't work that way anymore. Okay. Now what they will do is they take it and they say, well, your roof was done in, you know, 10 years ago and it's a 25 year roof. So we're going to prorate it and only pay you back 15 years of what it costs to fix this. And, and there's, there's other factors involved, but that's the kind of stuff they do nowadays. Well, a good home inspector, which is highly recommended, especially if you're on a tight budget and uh, maybe a first time home buyer, but even experienced ones. I used as uh, buying investment properties, I used a home inspection inspector for many years and yeah, it may cost you four or $500, but you're going to know exactly what you get into going into this. Most of them will give you a several page report too. Some of them are, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15, some of them even 20 pages long of details and they'll write this stuff down. They go through, they check pipes, they check uh, electrical, you know, outlets. I've, you know, I've even seen them, they have this little uh, thing they use, this tester. They go around and plug in, um, you know, plug this in every outlet in the home. They check the stuff out. They look at the wires. This stuff is very important. It's something that, especially when we get excited about buying a house, we find the home of our dreams, we think, and then we just don't think about some of this stuff. Well, what happens when you get in there and in the kid's bedroom, none of the outlets work? You know, I mean, you, you, it could be a problem and it could cost you several thousand dollars to rewire this because you got old wiring. I mean, there's just our old, you know, maybe it's not copper. Maybe it's during the time period where they put in um, the aluminum wire, something, you know, stuff like that. So that's home inspector can be somebody that you very much need. And it, it usually is recommended um, on your first, you know, your first deal or even even as your, your experience and you've bought many homes. Um, this can be one of your most important partners too. find somebody you trust and somebody you like and somebody that does a good job. Appraiser. OK, appraiser is just going to you know, this is different than a home inspector. Appraiser, somebody going to come out and what they do is they look at the look at the home and and these are really the uh, the main purpose of an appraiser is to make the loan work. I mean, it's simple, it's simple as farm. OK, they're going to look at the market, what homes have sold for. They've got rules. They can't go. You know, they have to look at like kind of houses, whether it's frame or brick, it has to be usually within depending on the, your, your situation it has to be within two miles. It can't pass a major thorough uh, road or a highway. It's got to be right in the neighborhood and it's got to be close to the square footage. When we used to have them, it used to have to be within 200 square foot. So you cannot necessarily compare like a 1600 square foot home with a 2800 square foot or even a 600 square foot. I mean, they're all different. They all have to be pretty much like kind um, homes. Now, this doesn't, the appraiser, this is not what you can necessarily get for the house. And they usually have a disclaimer on there telling you that that's not really the true value. This is really in its simplest form to make the loan work. Okay, so that's how that works. Because uh, you'll see, and you might have heard this in the last few years, people are paying over the listing price. And sometimes it gets way out of the appraised value. Uh, and they're they're just adding more cash in most of the situations. Uh, but that's not the appraiser's job. So that's that's something to keep in mind. 
insurance agent this is very uh this is very important you probably if you're a renter you probably have some renters insurance if not you should <laughs> okay but that's a good place to start you probably have car insurance if you have a car um this is another good place to start there you can look look at some groups uh but an insurance agent can be one of your best friends also you want to make sure you have the right kind of insurance for your situation again all this is done on an individual basis and you're going to see what's right for you uh, one of the things that we've done as uh, as investors over the year, one of the things I personally have done is raised our deductibles because I'm not going to file a claim unless it's going to be a big claim because when you have 20 or 30 places insured and you make a claim on one, there's a or you maybe have a couple claims in a year, there's a good chance they're going to raise them all. Well, if they raise all your insurance $500 a year, that could be a substantial amount of money. Being a first-time home buyer or just one buying on an individual basis, you're probably not going to have that concern. But that's something to keep in mind. It could be the difference in if you have a thousand dollar deductible or a twenty five hundred dollar deductible. It may make the difference in whether your debt ratio works for buying your home. OK, so that's stuff to consider. And in, in, there's also special endorsements. You may have a I don't know coin collection or jewelry and things like that. They're very limited on what the homeowner's insurance will cover. And that, again, will be where your insurance uh, agent or broker comes in. Very important to talk with them and go over the, your actual sit, situation. Sit down with them, whether it's on the phone uh, or virtual or even in the office. But just go over everything there because they are your friends. All these partners here are people that want to help you. Now, it is important to find out the one that's right for you too, because not one size does not fit all. And that's the way it is with buying a home too. One size does not fit all. All this, all this is done on an individual basis. So a uh, title company is another thing. Being a home buyer, it's not as probably critical as if you are the seller or that. And most of the time, these people are going to be already, uh, there, there are gonna, there's already going to be professionals that work with certain title companies. You know, there's different ones that deal in different areas. If you're uh, um, an investor, there's some that are more investor friendly than others. Uh, this is not a real big concern, but you do want to make sure that uh you know, that, that you're with a, a, a good, reliable company. I haven't heard of one, a uh, bad one in a long time. There was a company, oh, I don't know, we many, many, many years ago <clears throat> that sprung up and had little branches all over and they did a lot of fraudulent things. And in fact, the president went to jail. I think he's probably still in jail. I think he got a 20 year sentence or something, but you can't really mess with money, but you don't have a lot to worry about with as far as that goes, because most of the most of the people you're going to deal with, the professionals are going to be other professionals and they, you know, integrity is huge in this business. So you do want to make sure you do, you are dealing with somebody of, of uh, good integrity. We talked a little bit about the HOAs, the homeowners associations. These can be your best friends or your worst enemies. You, you want to be on their side though. And you want to be a person of value when you, when you go to a neighborhood, you want to be a good neighbor. And that's what they're looking for, uh, for the most part. Same thing with the property owner associations and the PUDs, the planned urban developments, there are similar situations, or any of the community organizations. There are some other groups out there and you're going to see these depending on the neighborhood that you're in. Uh, but these can be uh, these are going to be some of your partners, whether you want to or not. You really want to be aware of all this when you're uh, when you're looking at neighborhoods. Then we, of course, we have FISBOs and seller financing. Uh, FISBOs are for sale by owner. Sometimes people just want to list their properties by themselves without having it on the MLS or being uh, using a listing agent or, or a real estate broker. Um, sometimes it's because uh, they can't afford it. And sometimes they're just them kind of people. <laughs> okay, it just doesn't matter. But you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of investors that like to sell their properties uh, for sale by owner like this also and not have them listed. There's advantages and disadvantages to this, okay? Some of the disadvantages is they don't get out there so much. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, what, if you're not on the MLS, it doesn't get advertised out there. If you put things on the MLS, one of the great advantages is it gets out there and people see it all the time. There's a lot of people that comb through the MLS. That's the multiple listing service, in case I haven't said what that is. But that's a group, that's a uh, organization that the realtors, um, they all they all go to and they list their properties, okay? You can find out a lot of good information there. Um, 
One of the other things about the for sale by owners, though, the FISBOs, is they can work with, um, and one of the things I've seen in the past, you can work on the values a little bit. Sometimes if somebody has a tight margin and you need to, you know, you need to make it a little bit, um, you need to adjust the price a little bit up or down because, you know, because of the person's situation with their loan, you can, you're able to do that just a little bit. Now you, you can't go in there and say it's a $150,000 house and we need to make it 250,000. Doesn't quite work like that, but let's say you need, do need to make it like a $155,000 home. You can sometimes work with that and that might change the values if you're real tight on your debt to income ratio or something like that. So there, that's some of the kind of advantages like that. Um, without paying commissions, sometimes a lot of investors like to do that because they can give you a little bit a um, little bit better price and some of them do that with with our uh you know as, as you go along and you're dealing with different investors you'll you'll see some of that kind of stuff but the they are uh that is something you i want you to be aware of um there's private companies investors we've kind of talked a little bit about that there's a lot of private money out there and uh people that make certain you know certain loans sometimes you could get family members to loan you maybe some money on a short term basis or even a long term out of their their retirement accounts and things like that and you know there's there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different ways to get money out there for your home purchase but just to be aware of, of the different things but money is very important i always like to make sure you start there and just see where where you're at because like i said it is done on an individual basis and then the sweat equity land bank this is um this is something where we've been looking at to bring some of the partners together now that because there's a lot of people that um that have skills maybe you don't have the 10 or 20 percent that a bank may be requiring you to have to put down but maybe you have some skills maybe you're a plumber or electrician or you know there's a lot of different uh, skilled uh people out there maybe you could you could do some work on an investment property through through a program um you know or through through one of the investing programs that we're looking at here some of the homes that are being fixed up and maybe you could put in five hours worth of time and get credit in, in your land bank towards your purchase of your home. Maybe you don't have any skills. You're an unskilled laborer, but there's still things you could do. You might be able to, you know, carry the, go get the tools for the skilled people out of the truck and bring them there. Maybe you, you could pick up some trash around the neighborhood. I mean, there's just a lot of different things that we're looking at putting together here. And if you're interested in, in some of this and being part of the sweat equity uh, land bank, program when we're done um, i'm going to give you a way to get a hold of me and you can just ask for a, um, you know an application right now we do have a waiting list and and i'd be happy to talk to you more in detail about that at a uh, at another time here too so that's just something to keep in mind all right well let's talk about our pre-approval mortgage process we just talked about money and that's an important um important factor all right Everyone is individually underwritten, okay? There is not one size fit all, fits all. We kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, everybody is different, okay? Even if you come from the same family, it doesn't make any difference. You, they're going to go by your situation. OK, and there's a lot of a lot of factors to consider besides just the down payment. You also it's going to depend on your credit report. Um, you know, it, you know, it, you're going to have to have a lot of things done up front. And they're going to we're going to talk a little bit about a checklist here in a, in a couple minutes on some things to start getting together. <clears throat> OK, there's many different types of loans available. You'll hear certain things, but don't necessarily think that's going to apply to you you're also going to have things that's not going to apply to other people okay they're just all done individually some of the loans you can see out there of course most people most of us have heard of fha that's the federal housing administration they have many programs that are very good especially first first time home buyers three percent down you might have five percent down uh va is another one veterans administration um, if you're a uh, if you've been a vet if you are a veteran if you've been in the armed services uh, you may qualify for a VA loan. Typically, these are more than a hundred percent of the value of the home. Again, they're underwritten a little bit differently, and there are other things you have to do. But if you have like a, a, I think it's DD two fourteen, that's one of the things you'll want to get together. 
um, with your checklist. I don't think I put that on the checklist, but that's one of the things you're going to want to have when you go to your money person, your broker, your banker, uh, whoever you go to for the money, uh, if you qualify and if you're looking for a Veterans Administration loan. USDA, um, this is something that's really not going to apply to most of us, but if you're in a, a, a rural area, there's some good programs out there where you'll have less money up front if you qualify for this program. Um, that's, that might be a good way for you to go. Conventional loans, this is what most of us will end up uh, going through if we go through a traditional lender or a banker. Um, traditionally and typically, they'll want 20% down. Sometimes there's 10%. You may deal with a local bank, uh, you know, a regional bank that may want a little bit less down. Again, it's done on an individual ba uh, basis. You're going to have to see what you qualify for when you go through the underwriting process. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but that's, that is something that, you know, most of us kind of know that. Private money, there's no necessarily rules when you're dealing with private money. We kind of touched on maybe, um, you know, you might have a relative or somebody you know, or you might even have it uh, in, in your own retirement account. You may have a Roth IRA or somebody else may where they could loan you the money. They could even loan you the money for all it, 100% of it. You just make payments back to their IRA account. There's, um, you know, there's just a lot of different ways. There's a lot of creative ways, which we're not really going to get into today, but there's a lot of creative ways to buy homes and get financing that we've, we've done a lot of over the years um, that you, you know, there's just ways to do it. And depending on your situation, <clears throat> it may be something you, you want to do. Um, you know, you may want to look at something, you may need to do something a little bit differently than conventional or something else. Well, there is private money out there. And then hard money, this is probably the most expensive money. Um, typically, they charge a lot of points up front. That's your percentages. They may charge you 3 or 5% up front just to underwrite your loan. They typically do not go on credit. They loan on the value of the property, typically. So, And they typically will not loan... Uh, pretty much higher that usually than about 70%. Now it, it, it depends. There's exceptions to everything, of course, but they typically will require you to have a little bit more money up front. This is a good way though, to maybe work with your sweat equity too. Um, maybe they will loan you, let's say that a home needs, uh, needs repairs. Let's say you have a just, and we'll just use a hundred thousand because it's easy to work with. Let's say that uh, you found a hundred thousand dollar home uh, is what the current value is right now but the after repair value is let's say uh 150,000. Well, let's say you are a plumber or you know electrician or you know how to get some of the skilled work done and that's what the property needs. Well, may a hard money lender might come through and loan you uh the 100,000 based on the after repair value because we'll give you this money now you fix it up. Now you'll have to pay some money up front and it is expensive money. Uh, but it's a lot of times it's a way to get stuff done and you'll just pay a higher interest rate. Let's say that you're approved for an 8% rate, but they're going to charge you 12%. Well, hard money is never a long-term uh, solution anyway. It's usually very short term. It's a way to get things done. A lot of times I see, especially investors use hard money to get something done because they need it. They have a short time to close on it. Um, and it's not always the cost of the money, but it's what the value is that you get out of it. I've borrowed money myself, even being a good borrower, a lot of times just to get the deal done because I didn't have quite the money in my pocket at the time to get, get certain things done. Well, this is a way you can even use this to buy your, your, uh, your home to live in that way too. And then you can refinance that when your situation gets a little better. Let's say maybe your credit's not as good. You need to work on that. That's a big aspect for a lot of times people going into, well, this is a way you could do that. And then you refinance him and you pay the hard money off, you go to a conventional loan based on current values and you get better terms and, and better, uh, you know, a better loan. So that's one of the things. And, and again, we can get really deep into some of this kind of stuff. If you got some questions on it, I'm happy to answer too when we uh, when we get done with some, with some of this stuff. But every situation is different and individually underwritten. Uh, some of the things uh, there's, and this goes back to all the different kinds of loans. We have fixed rates. Most people are familiar with a fixed rate. If you get approved for an 8% loan, it's 
for the lifetime of the loan, that's what it is. It's fixed. Now, adjustable rates, uh, these are loans. Uh, there's most of the investor loans I see are adjustable. Uh, they're fixed for a certain amount of time, but there are uh, there are times when you being the homeowner and owner occupant that you do, you know, you will use an adjustable rate. Let's say you you don't qualify because of your debt to income ratio originally for the eight eight percent loan, but let's say they get you in at six percent because you're you've got a tight margin. Well, that might be fixed for a certain amount of time. There are there's all kinds of different um, adjustability periods too. There's anywhere from one year, three years, five years. Um, there's 15 years. I've seen all kinds of stuff out there, depending on the uh, term. Um, but but let's say that you have an adjustable rate of 6% and let's say it's fixed for five years. Okay, that's what it's going to do. Then most of them are, uh, they go by a table, uh, like an index, like uh for the, you know, for federal, uh, there's just different things that they do. It might be on the uh, federal reserve rate of, let's say, let's say whatever it is at the time. And let's say right now it's, it's 5%. Then they'll say, well, it's based in five years. It's going to be, uh, when we adjust it, it's going to be 5% plus one and a half percent more than whatever the federal amount is. So you, if it's still 5%, you'll pay six and a half percent at that time. Now rates have gone up in the last year or so. So this is going to be, and these are, that's why they're adjustable. There's no predictable way to tell what these are going to be, but this is a lot of times a good loan for you. If you're an investor, you may be, you know, this may be your only choice. Uh, balloon mortgages is another thing. And what that is, is uh, you're going to be, it's going to, your loan will be at a certain payment. And sometimes they're interest only, uh, which is the next little thing here. Sometimes they're based on principal and interest. Um, and a good example of this is uh, there used to be a company we dealt with many years ago because of debt ratio. We'd, we'd use them, but it was, uh, it was actually uh, first union. And then they got bought out by the money store and somebody else. But they, what they would do is they would do a 15 year balloon note. Okay. But they would base your payments on a 30 year amortization. That means it was like you were paying a 30 year loan, but then in 15 years, the balance, okay, you were paying principal and interest, but the balance was due. So you would have to refinance at the 15 year period or pay them off. Now I like I personally like that one because, and I'll tell you, there's a few reasons why I did like that one. First of all, you got a better payment than you did if you took out a 15-year loan or something like that. There's also many ways you can pay this down. We can, and we can talk something, you know, pay these off early. We can talk a little bit about those. But what would have what what I did notice too, and this is back, I don't know what it is today, but a, a few years ago when I was a mortgage broker, the average 30-year loan uh, lifespan was only seven and a half years. That means no matter how many people took out a 30 year loan, you would be, you would, your situation would change. Our family situations change. Our life situation changes now. And it, you know, and, and it's probably still pretty close to this, but it was about every seven years. So that's how long they lasted. So by having a 15 year balloon mortgage, uh, we knew that they were either going to refinance or they were going to move back then the interest rates were still coming down too. And a lot of people would just refinance because if you could get a one and a half or two points better on your mortgage, your payment could come down significantly, sometimes a couple hundred dollars a month. And if you choose to keep putting that money into that, you know, into your loan and you could pay that thing off in just a few years. <clears throat> one of the things also on, on just a, just a, on, on some of this kind of stuff, let's just go to the next uh, the next point here is the terms. You'll have 30 year terms, which we kind of talked about. You've probably that's the one that people are most common, uh, most commonly referred to. You've also probably heard of 15 year terms. Um, there's anything, though, from one year, I've even seen six months, uh, like if you're doing, dealing with a hard money lender, you may have a six month term. Uh, there's there's a lot of them now doing 40 year terms. Um, I, I don't like that, you know, myself. Um, it's like the, you know, eight year, 10 year car loans. Um, yeah, I guess it's okay for the right situation. I, that's just something I don't prefer. Uh, but that's, you know, but that's up to you. So, you know, if you're tight on your debt to income ratio, you may need to do that. Two other things. There's lots of other terms that we'll just talk about two other types of loans for our purposes today. And that would be a, a HELOC. That's a home equity line of credit. Um, if you have equity in your existing home or as you get to be established and you have build up some equity in your property, you may qualify for a home equity line of credit. And the, these are great, especially for uh, 
for new investors and people that may want to maybe not have an extra hundred thousand dollars in the bank cash to buy an investment property because you may be looking for your first rental property or something like that but you'll have a line of credit you can actually be a cash buyer by having this now there are limitations and there are restrictions you will definitely need to know about that before you do that most of these are renewed on an annual basis and then they adjust accordingly we've had a business account which is similar to that for a uh, line of credit for many years but it is underwritten every year every year they look at our credit and they adjust the interest rates by the margin depending on what the fed the feds are doing so that's stuff to be keep in mind but this is a great way to to buy homes and have access to quick cash. And this could be, I, I like to use these for a short term um, situation. So let's say you do find, let's say you do find a, uh, a house in a, in a good neighborhood, but the person has to have the money right away because of a, I don't know, a lot of different situations are moving, having a foreclosure, family emergency. You might be able to buy a hundred thousand dollar house for $50,000, but you may not have the 50,000 in the bank, but you may have $50,000 in a home equity line of credit. And so that's that's one way you could actually write a check and buy that house tomorrow. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of different things you can use these for. Again, use caution when you use these. Just be aware of, uh, uh, you know, of what these are and how they work, because if they call your loan in a year from now and you're not able to pay it, they could actually foreclose on your home. OK, because this is a line of credit based on equity in your home and that's what it's that's where it comes from that's how it's used so just be aware of it second mortgages are another thing these are usually more of a long term you take out let's say you have a 30 year uh fixed rate or even adjustable on your first uh your as a four, first mortgage but let's say you'll need 10 or fifteen thousand dollars to do something else and you don't want to refinance maybe you know for different reasons there's a lot of reasons why you may or may not you could take out like a second mortgage um these and this will go in the second position on your on, on your uh, on your actually on your title. So if you were to get foreclosed on down the road, the first would come in the first position. The second mortgage would get paid off after that. So but you may want to take out a 10 or 15 year second mortgage to go along with this and pay it off on a short term basis for stuff like home repair. I mean, there's there's reasons like that. So those are just there's many more types of things. Now, one of the things I just want to say on the rates, though, too, let's say that your situation is not as good as maybe it will be because you're working on improving yourself. And and most people do like to improve themselves anyway, even if you've got a pretty decent credit score and pretty decent stuff going on. You're, there's no reason why you shouldn't continue to improve your situation as you pay stuff down and make your payments on time. Your situation should uh, improve. But let's say for whatever reason, um, let's say you have an 8% uh, rate for 30 years and you don't want to refinance down the road, start your term over. Or, yeah, I mean, there's different reasons why you may not. Well, there's there's a few ways that you can pay this off just like you borrowed money at, le at lesser percent. And one of the things we used to do for people is we would get the, let's get, and I, I encourage you to do this, get a copy of your amortization schedule. What that is, that's the whole term of your loan, and it shows your principal and interest, okay? And that breaks that down completely. That's not your insurance and taxes. That's another whole story, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes here. But your principal and interest, it's going to show, um, and just for example, if you have a 30-year loan, let's say you're paying... Um, $950 for the first month in interest and $50 in principal. And it may, it may or may not be that much, but it is something significant, the difference. At the end of the term, as you make your payments, they change a little bit each month. And at the end of the term, it will be exactly um, the opposite. So at the end of the uh, the 30th payment uh, or the th the 360th payment, which is the 30th year, then, then you're getting the maybe 50% interest and 950 is going towards the principal. OK, because the principal is what you're going to want to pay down as you go along. Um, a typical loan, if it's a fixed rate at the 15 year point or half year point, depending on where you're at, will be uh, it should be exactly 50, 50, 50 percent interest, 50 percent principal. OK, well, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. One of the things that, in fact, what, what I did with my very first uh, conventional loan I had is I, I got my schedule and I took the interest um, from the very last payment and applied it to the first payment by doing that. And it's just, it was like 15 bucks or $50 or something. I don't remember the exact amount, but it wasn't that much. Well, I can afford to do that every month. It goes up a few dollars. And if you do that exact formula right there, you will pay your 30 year 
loan off in 15 years. Okay. What that is like doing though, that is because of the compounded interest rate. What that is actually doing is like borrowing money at 4% instead of the 8% because you're paying it off in exactly half the time without the obligation. So let's say that you're doing that for a while. Let's say your situation changed and let's say you're five years into it and maybe you're, you know, it's an extra 250 or $300 a month interest that you were adding to that. If you have a bad month, you don't have to do that. You're not locked in. You're only locked into what your actual payment is. Another thing you can do, something we used to do for a lot of people, they say, well, that's too complicated. I don't want to look at that every month. Um, they'll say, well, I, but I got an extra 50 or a hundred dollars right now that I could do that. That's great. Take that and get your money person too. You can run this off. You can actually do it yourself. I'm sure you can find software online these days for that. We used to have to buy it, but you could, you could probably find this, see what it would do by adding another $50 a month, every month. And without trying to figure anything else out, like, like what we just talked about. Well, by doing that, you might pay your loan off in, in say 18 or 20 years, just by adding an extra $50 per month. That's still like borrowing money at a better rate. So that's just a couple of things to consider. And um, I, I like you to be aware of that because it's not always what it says on paper as far as what you're doing, because you can you can make your situation different than everybody else's and you can improve your situation. You make yourself, even though your loans are individually um, underwritten, you, you make yourself individually underwritten. What the way you deal with it, you don't have to do what everybody else does. And you can change this and it can be adjusted over time because things do change every year. We make our plans and then we have to adjust accordingly, no matter what it is. But loans, especially, a lot, you know, if you want to get yourself in line to buy your home, but then you can make your situation better as time goes on. You get, uh, let's say you do improve your situation down the road, you have more income coming in, you can start paying this thing off and you can pay your 30 year loan off in five years. We used to have a program we worked with and um, one of the beauties of it was is that we could show you how to pay off all your debts in seven to 10 years, including your 30 year mortgage without spending any more money than you're currently doing. And, and that's what you're kind of doing here. You can just take what you're doing right now and you can improve your situation. So that's just a couple of things to be aware of with the mortgages um, and, and during the process is what, what you can expect. Um, escrows. The other thing we need to talk about are you can have escrows withheld by the uh, lender or your money people, or you can do the self-pay, what I call self-pay. I personally like to do the self-pay because I control it, um, but that's basically your taxes, insurance. If you're required to have PMI insurance, that's your uh, private mortgage insurance. And typically what that is, that's almost always with like FHA and some of the other uh, loans like that. If you don't put 20% down, a lot of the lenders will require you to have this private mortgage insurance. Some of them call it MIP. It just depends on, on the, the institution. But what that does is that's a little bit of insurance you're going to be required to pay every month. It's a fee they put in right in your payment that will pay if you were to default on the loan that pays the difference up to the 20%. Okay. Um, so let's say, let's say, for example, you put 5% down and two years into this, uh, you know, you have your situation changes and you have a foreclosure, but you still not at eight, you still have not put the amount of money, which would be 20% of the total equity position in your home. This insurance would pay that to the lender. It really doesn't pay you anything. It is not any other insurance other than to pay the lender up to the 20% or whatever was required for the initial uh, down payment. Sometimes there's other fees included in this too. Um, it just depends on what they are. I personally like to pay the taxes and insurance myself. Uh, escrows do get adjusted. So that's just something to keep in mind. Some people need the discipline to, to do this themselves and there's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes it's required and you just have to pay the escrows. That's not all bad. The things that you, you know, this is based on the current year situation and you cannot um, necessarily um, use this uh, for next year because they they'll, they're going to adjust this from year to year. A lot of years they stay the same, but let's take, for example, this past year, we have some uh, properties here in our area that went up, the taxes went up, uh, they doubled. So they went up 50, they went up a hundred percent, which is, you know, it's a fit, complete 50% more than what it was. Well, that's just an insurance alone. 
the, I mean, uh, taxes alone, insurance also went up on a lot of these because it costs more to insure them now that their values are higher. So, and that's based, a lot of that's based on um, what the home sold for in the last few years. Uh, property values, real, real estate values have, have gone up quite a bit in certain areas. Well, your escrows are going to go up. You're going to have to pay more for your taxes and insurance. Okay, if, if you're doing this uh, as a self-pay, you're going to be writing these checks out yourself. But the escrows, they're also going to adjust. So if you even if you have a fixed rate on your, let's say, a 30 or 15 year term on your mortgage and you're paying escrows with this. OK, let's say you're paying a thousand dollars a month on your on your payment and um, your escrows go up one hundred and fifty dollars. Well, you're going to pay eleven fifty next year. That has nothing to do with your rate and term, even if you're on a fixed rate. So that's something you need to be aware of, because these things do adjust from time to time. In the past, I've had them go down, but we, they've also gone way up. And this year is one of those times when they have gone up. So that's stuff to be uh, to be aware of. So regardless of what your uh what your lender requires, whether you have to do it yourself or self-pay, you're going to pay it one way or the other, but you need to be uh, aware of these uh, of these charges. All right, well, let's start looking at the actual uh, process, mortgage process and checklist. This is just going to get you started. I like to tell you this stuff up front before you get pre-approved. Not everything is going to apply. Again, it's all done by um, in, in uh, individual underwritten basis. Um, I don't know of any, uh, what they used to call them ninja loans, not income, not no income, no job is what basically they were, but you didn't have to prove anything back in the day. Um, they used to have these, uh, what they called subprime loans. I don't think there's too many of them anymore after the 2007, eight and nine financial crisis that we had, they've gotten rid of a lot of those, uh, a lot of those type of loans. It used to be, they would base, if you had a credit score, they wouldn't care about uh, income or anything else. I don't know of any of those programs available anymore. And I personally wouldn't like to do them. I didn't even like them back then because I seen a lot of people that would default on there and there was just a lot of crazy stuff going on. I don't think there's any of them, but um, I think most things are underwritten pretty, I don't know, I wouldn't say heavily, but they're underwritten depending on what your situation is. If you've got a track record with mortgages uh, and you have an individual banking relationship, um, that's one thing. But if you don't, if you're just starting out or if you were looking to expand uh, and maybe level up your investments, um, I just want to give you an idea of some of the stuff to start getting together. Um, first thing is you want to get your mortgage, you want to get a pre-approval letter in writing and with the stipulations. You want a checklist from the person. You want to be underwritten. Uh, you want them to look at it, at least the pre-approval. It will be underwritten after you get your stipulations together and after you get everything together that they're going to tell you before you buy your home, then you're going to have an approval process after the pre-approval process. You're going to have an approval process, which you'll actually go into underwriting. But your stipulations are all the things that you need to get together. And that's what we're going to put together on this checklist here is some stuff for you to start with. Um, this is not a complete list, but this is stuff that you're going to need to get together. First of all, you're going to need a government-issued identification doc document of some kind. Now, there's different things that they, they will take and not take. Typically, driver's license, state ID. Um, a, lot of, a lot of places will let you use a passport. You're almost always required to get an original Social Security card. There may be some other things, but this is just some standard things that you're going to want to get together right out of you know, right, right off the bat to have ready when you go for your pre-approval. Now, proof of income. This is going to include a lot of things, okay? Um, recent pay stubs, uh, I I typically would tell you to get together 90 days worth. Some, some lenders out there will tell you 60, some even 30, but just go ahead and get together 90 days. And the reason for that is, is because situations change. You may have been out for one week because of a sickness uh, last month or something like that. But if you have all these others, this is going to show your uh, pay stub history. This is going to show your employment history, what you actually get. They can average this a lot of times. Now, these you're probably going to need to get together as your uh, underwriting and per approval process is underwritten too, because you may have to update this stuff. But get this together right out the right out of the gate. I tell you the last three months, W-2s, if you're a W-2 employee, they take taxes right out of your check, get together your last two years worth of W-2s, okay? If it's close to the end of the year, get together three because you'll have another one coming up. 
1099s, if you're a self-employed person, um, if you get self-employment or if you have a, a side business, side hustle, anything like that, you get 1099 wages, get that stuff together. Because even though you'll take expenses out of that, they, a lot of times they want to see your cash flow and what you actually have coming in. Two years worth of tax returns. This is pretty standard. Sometimes uh, you'll need to get together more than that, but typically two years of your tax returns. This is with your schedules on there. Anything that you do, whether you do your taxes yourself or you have somebody else do it, you got an accountant or you know a tax person, get together that stuff there and just have it available for your, for your money person. Uh, you're going to need verification of employment or self self-employment. Um, uh, v VOE, they call these. You're going to need a verification, a VOR, verification of rent or previous residence. There's a, they call VOs, whatever, VOR, VOEs and stuff like that. You're going to hear a lot of these, uh, these kind of acronyms. Uh, but just if you, if you're not clear on something, ask them exactly what they are because of the, uh, your loan person should know this. There's going to be other verifications. There's too many where, you know, the, there's a lot of them out there and there's too many for us to list here. And most of them are not going to be important to you. Letters of explanation. This is something that, um, that you may or may not need. Uh, we have done this a lot in the past and sometimes they're going to want to see, let's see you had, and, and this goes back to, you know, maybe your pay stubs, maybe you did have a, um, an absence of, uh, let's say for six weeks during the last year or something, your W-2s are a little bit short on cash. Well, your letter of explanation may be, you know, due to an auto accident, I was out of work and I only collected, you know, a worker's compensation or, 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 you know, or maybe you were laid off. I only had unemployment. Maybe you're a union worker and they lay you off certain seasons of the year. You might, you know, th you can explain this this way. You know, I know the pipe fitters, uh, you know, they, they make real good money. We've done a lot of loans with them in the past when I used to work with the unions. And, but one of the things where a lot of them would be laid off at times, or they would voluntarily lay themselves off some of the senior partners that so they could let the, the younger guys, uh, you know, get the job. So, I mean, there's just a lot of things, but you can explain this kind of stuff. And this, a lot of times, is, this is good. Now, this is not this is not really going to affect your credit score. We'll talk more about that in a little bit here, but uh, this is something you can explain your situation because it is un individually underwritten. Um, this is something that could explain this. Now, the one thing I want to point out, you'll see only give them what they ask for. I usually tell you, get all this stuff together. And that's one of the things I did as a mortgage broker. I'd have you get all the stuff together, but I would not necessarily give all the information to the actual lender or the money person, the bank. Only give them what they ask for. Because what happens is a lot of times you'll be opening it opening up a can of worms. Okay. There could be something. Now you'll have to explain something that you didn't necessarily have to explain. And I've seen it actually in, in certain cases, they were kind of rare, but it did happen where the, where by giving them too much information would cause you not to get the loan. Okay. There was just, there's just, uh, we won't get into all the details, but this is just some of the stuff, get all this stuff together. This is a good checklist. What I'm giving you right here. To get to get stuff to get together before you go get your uh, before you get your pre approval, but then let them give you the letter with the stipulations, and then give them exactly and only what they ask for. Uh, proof of funds, typically this is required. Uh, that's your financial information. If you're using money from a 401k or a retirement account, they're going to want some copies of that. That's pretty easy stuff usually because you're, if you're at an employer that and they, you know, a lot of them have matching funds, things like that, and you'll show ongoing putting money into it, but they'll want to see where you're, you know, what, where you're getting the money from, if that's what you're using. And are, a lot of times they want to see that you just have some assets. I know some of the companies we used to look for, they didn't care about, you know, about you using the money. In fact, they encourage you and they did not want you to use your retirement accounts, but they wanted to see you have it because what happens is a lot of times the people, you know, the people that have assets, they typically will not default on their loans. And that that's a big red flag. A lot of times, if you have absolutely no money put away, but you have availability to do that, they want to know, you know, what, why, why aren't you doing that? And it, it could be you know, that you have a different situation. You know, a lot of us have sickness or illness we have elderly parents and things going on you maybe you you know instead of putting that 200 dollars a month into your retirement account maybe you are helping to do something with some home care so i mean there's just a lot of things like that but that's they do like to see assets so that's something you want to want to get together again don't give it to them unless they ask for it 
three months worth of bank statements. And this is something you're going to want to do. Savings, checking his account, any other kind of um, accounts that you have, you're going to want to get that together. And then a lot of them will require a gift letter. And, and what this is, is it, let's say you do have a relative or somebody, a uh, parent or somebody that's giving you some money. Maybe you uh, qualify for a 3% down FHA loan, but you don't have the 3%, but your mom or dad or somebody in your family does, and they're willing to give you this money that you do not have to pay back. Well, we talked about this the money that need to be seasoned and sourced. You're, they're going to want to know where it came from. This is, well, they're going to want to know uh, that your mom took money out of their retirement account, out of their their savings account and they gave it to you. She'll simply need to write a letter. You know, I've, I've seen this, we've done this many times in the past, just saying, hey, this is money uh, that, you know, I'm giving, gifting to my daughter uh, to buy in the purchase of their home. And it does not have to be paid back. They do in the gift letter. This is not something where your mom says, yeah, it's just like the car loan. You know, we gave them last year and we want $300 a month until it's paid back. No, you, that's not what a gift letter is. If that's the case, you can, it, and your debt ratio works out, you could do it that way, but that's not what this is. You're going to want to get that together. Again, only get that together and give it, give it to the underwriter if they ask for it. And you're going to want a completed uh, loan application. Uh, fill the things out completely, whether you do it online or in person. Then the, the uh, person pre-approving you, the loan person, the money person, will want a copy. Uh, will give you a copy of your credit history. This right here says a lot. Again, this is on an individual basis, and we're going to talk a little bit about credit um, right now. Okay, and this is one of the things I'm going to give you a complimentary copy of today. This is a, a book. Actually, I wrote this a few years ago. And the reason I did that, because I was a mortgage broker for many years, and I don't know, this is around 2015, 16, there was a lot of these companies I, I noticed that sprung up. And I called them credit doctors because all they really did was confuse people. This is this is my opinion, but this is what I seen. I questioned a lot of them on this too, but they didn't do anything to really help your credit. They would set you up on a monthly thing, thinking they could. Some of the credit bureaus and the reporting agencies are even guilty of this, and I still see this out today. But they would do stuff not really to help you, and a lot of times they would hurt you in the long run because if you didn't make their two hundred dollar payment or their, even their forty dollar payment, which was some of them. Uh, they would actually come back because you signed up as a creditor. They would actually put this on your credit report and it would actually hurt you. And I got really upset about this. It actually made me angry. So I wrote, I put this book together. I'd written a credit book back in like 2010 and it wasn't near this, this detailed. And I thought people need to know um, what to do and they don't need to pay for it. Cause I work with many people. Our office did for many years. Sometimes people two, three years get their credit back in line because people just don't know. And there's really not a good source out there. So I, we put this together with the workbook and I try to simplify it. If you know anything about me and I know some of you do that I like, there's two things, um, two pretty much two rules that I live by on pretty much everything. The first thing is kissers. Keep it simple, really simple. One of the things the credit doctors that did out there is they didn't, they complicated stuff, confuse people and charge some stuff. The other rule I live by is win, win, win. Everybody's got to win in the situation or I won't do it. There's um, there's always at least three people that need to win, no matter what your situation is. If you're the seller of a property, you need to win with your outcome. If you're the buyer of the property, you need to win by buying it. And then the community needs to win. There's uh, everybody involved needs to win. The lender needs to win. There's just, there's so many different sources. I always say win, 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 but there's typically more than three people, but those are the things that I always look at. But the reason I wrote this book was just because, and actually I wrote it, it's kind of a funny story. I wrote this to actually give it away. I, Amazon won't let you give it away. So we put it on there. Uh, free for a while. And then I, you can only do that like, I don't know, five days or something every couple of years or every year, I think it is. Uh, so I put this in a PDF farm that I, I had with the, some of my partners and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this, give this to you today. But this was one of the things we did. And it was kind of funny because 
I put this on here to give it away, got it up on Amazon. And then after it had been there for a year or two, all of a sudden we started getting all these sales and I'm, I'm you know, I'm getting my, I'm getting like uh, royalties from Amazon. I'm like, well, what, who's buying all these credit books? Well, one night um, my wife, Laura and I were laying in bed and uh, I'm sitting there and I couldn't sleep. It's probably three in the morning. I'm flipping around the TV, just trying to go to sleep. And I, I came across the, uh, I don't know if you remember, you probably remember Larry King used to do those infomercials. He was doing a thing on credit secrets and I, I woke up Laura and said, this is why everybody's buying the book. He's doing an infomercial and people are going to Amazon and they see they looked up credit uh, secrets. And when they do that, it, it's secrets those credit doctors don't want you to know. So <clears throat> we had sold over a period of time uh, lots and lots of these books. And that's not why I wrote it, but it has helped a lot of people. So that's one thing that I want to continue to do today. This is worth way more than than a lot of the things you'll that you'll see out there but this is a way that i can kind of give back it's a way of simplifying things plus creating a win-win-win situation and we're going to talk just a little bit about the, about this today not a whole lot if you'd like to know i, I did do a, a longer uh longer workshop not too long ago it's still kind of a mini workshop you're going to get this book here with the uh with all the steps and the uh the workbooks included now in this if you want to know more just simply ask me at the end i'll give you a way to get a hold of me and i can send you the uh a link to that uh, workshop that we did with a lot more detail on you on improving your credit score. So let's just we're just going to talk a little bit about this uh, right here today. And first of all, what are credit scores? We've all heard a lot about credit scores, and but basically, what are they? And well, credit scores range between 300 and really 850 for the mortgage industry. They do go up to 900 for certain industries. I know the car industry used to go up to 900. It just depends on what it is. But for our purposes right here, it's going to be uh, 300 to 850. Obviously, the higher sc score you have, the better off um, you're going to be. That's not the only thing that's looked at in a, in a mortgage underwriting process, but that's very important. And there's a lot of things you can do. This is an ongoing process too. This is something you're going to want to know up front, what your credit uh, score is. Okay. And where, where are you starting from? What is your starting point? Okay. Um, now we, most of us have heard about FICO scores and that's what some people relate to. It's kind of, it's not really a generic term like it is, uh, spoken about though. This is actually your FICO score is related to Experian. There's actually two other scores too, that that's included when you get a tri-merge report. The next one is an Empirica score that comes from your TransUnion report. Then the, th the third one is your Beacon score. And, uh, recently they started calling it your Pinnacle score, and this is related Related through Equifax. These are the three uh, fair credit reporting. Um, they're not really agencies. FACRAs are a little bit different, F fair credit reporting agencies, but these are the uh, credit agencies themselves that actually report the information based on you. And these are the different ones. Uh, when you go for a mortgage loan, they typically will pull up what they call a tri-merge report because not all your creditors report to all three agencies. There's a fee that they have to pay every month. So if you're making a car pay, let's say you're, you're, you've got a car loan with a local um, local dealership in, in town, wherever you're at, and you're making payments uh, through their uh through their loan loan agency, well, they may only be TransUnion. Yeah, you know, that might be the local area, so that's all they report to. They may not want to pay the fee to report to all three bureaus. But let's say you have a, and th this comes up too. This is why they do tri merge reports. But let's say that you've had a couple of late payments during the term of your car loan or something like that, which will show up on on TransUnion, but it will not show up on the other two. So you may have a 750 score with with a FICO score and a Beacon score with Experian and Equifax, but you may only have a 620 score with TransUnion with your Empirica score because of the payment, your payment history. Well, this, the Tri-Merge report will reflect and show all that. It brings it all together. That's done during the underwriting process. So that's some important stuff. Um, then again, you know, I've seen, I've seen some of the 
places in the past, I don't know if they still do this, but they'll only pull up one. So people would say, well, I don't have to worry about my, my Empirica score because my FICO score is all they look at. And that could be true. That's typically true for like um, car loans and different type payday loans, things like that. They typically don't look at a lot of the other stuff, but that's something that you want to keep in mind. But the um, mortgage loans is almost always underwritten with a tri-merge report. But those are the three scores you're going to be um, you're going to be want to be aware of. That's how that works. What credit scores are are actually it's, it's in its simplest form, a little bit more complicated than this because they go by models and things like that, which we're not going to get into. And again, like, like I said, I like to simplify things. Uh, credit scores are just simply predictors and they're designed to show the likelihood that a borrower will become 90 days late on an account within the next 24 months. That's I've got that directly from the credit bureaus in its simplest form, and that's really what they look at. You can, you know, people say a lot of different things, but this is this is uh, what it is right here. Why do you care about your credit score? Well, it's, it should seem obvious, but it's your ability to borrow money. Um, is somebody going to give you money? How, how you've been paying your bills? So that is what they're going to look at. This is your ability. That's why you should care about your credit score. Better interest rates. If you've got a 780 score, you're going to get a better interest rate than if you have a 580 credit score. Okay. It's just, I mean, that's just, just the way it works. You're going to get a better interest rate. You can improve your situation. That's why people do um, refinance down the road and get other situations, you know, other, other interest rates, because you can do that as your situation improves. Lower insurance premiums. This is actually a big deal. Um, it may not seem like it. And, you, you know, but the difference in like a homeowner's insurance premium, we talked a little bit about homeowners that you're going to have to have some insurance up front when you um, when you buy your home or, you know, even whether it's an investment home or a first time home or, a, you know, just owner occupant, but you're going to have to buy insurance. Well, they're going to look at your credit score. You know, I used to think, think this didn't look, this didn't seem very fair. And it just, you know, I'd say, why? Why would somebody have to pay more because of their credit score? Well, what they found out, and because of the actuaries, is uh, people with lower credit scores tend to have a uh, uh, you know a higher frequency of filing fraudulent claims. I'm not saying that you're going to do that, and I don't I'm not saying that I ever known anybody, even though I have seen a couple of shady situations over the years. But um, this is something that they're going to look at, and you know, and what difference would a, your credit score make? You could be thinking, so what? I'm working on it now. Well, it, it could be a big deal because your homeowner's insurance could be the difference of eighteen hundred dollars a year are $1,200 a year, okay? That may even make a difference on your debt ratio, whether you can afford this house or not. So that's something to keep in mind. And they typically will check every year or two, just sometimes it's random, that's what they say, but they will look just to see. When you go to renew your insurance, they might, might wanna just see what's happened in the last year. Okay, but yeah, they, I mean, there's other things to take into consideration on your insurance, like claims history and things like that. Um, they take in zip codes, neighborhoods, uh, what you've, you know, your your auto insurance. They look at a lot of different things, but the credit scores is a big factor these days. And that's something you need to be aware of because it will give you better insurance premiums. Um, more favorable for employers and, and business partners. I know we're talking about buying homes here, but um, your employers, a lot of times they will look at your credit score. In addition to looking at your social media and some other stuff that they do that they used to not do, they will look at typically look at your credit score. And some of them do have factors on, you, you know, you may not be employable because you have a lower credit score. And there, of course, there's things you can do to improve it. And, you know, uh, the, the book that I'm going to give you, it has a lot of a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of good things. And you can ask me if you have a specific question on that, too. Uh, things we can do to get your situation better. Um, this is what I prefer more than anything is you choose who you want to do business with. With a low credit score, you may not have a choice on who gives you the loan and where you can go and who to do business with. You might be very limited on, on who will actually even do business with you. But if you've got a good credit score and a good history, you can actually choose who you want to do business with. And a lot of times you can you can get the better rate. It may only be a quarter or a half percent or three quarters of a percent, but that can be make all the difference. And why not have that money in your pocket or putting it towards the principal, paying down your debt and your loan than, than giving it to somebody else? So this is this is to me is one of the big, big major factors here. Now, 
<clears throat> how do they determine scores? We're going to break this down just a little bit, um, just to kind of let you know what's going on. It gets a little bit deeper than this, and we go into a lot more detail in the book here, which which you'll have. The first thing is 35% of your overall score goes uh, is based on your payment history. And this this should seem obvious. Do you pay, pay your bills on time? Uh, do you make your payment on time every month? They have actually categories they put you into, and it's like uh, on time, 30 days late, 60 days late, 90 days late are, are then 120 plus is the way, uh, the way they do it. And there's some different variations to that. But you want to make your payments on time. One of the things to keep in mind here, though, too, is the 30 day late, the first category I talked about here, too. Um, and you'll see this a lot of times they'll give you and you probably heard of this. They'll give you a what they call a grace period. They'll say your payment is due on the first, but they will not They'll give you a grace period up till the 15th. Um, and then we're going to charge you a, a late fee, um, you know, and, and penalize you on that. Uh, but typically that does not show up on the credit reporting agency as a late fee. You may, let's say that you get it in uh, 20 days after the first, you get it paid on the 20th of the month. They may charge you that percentage and the penalty as being late in their, their eyes, but it does not show late according to the credit bureau. Okay. Now, a couple things to keep in mind on that too, though, is they will charge you the amount. And typically, they will also charge you interest. Every day you do not have your payment in by the first, if that's your due date, they may only charge you a percentage, they say down, you know, up to the 15th, um, then they will charge you a little bit after that. But they typically will charge you interest for every day that payment is not in their on their desk and credited. Uh, before that. So even if they don't show it late, they that's again, you may pay for that in the long run. And they tack that on the end. You may not find that out a lot of times till you get a payoff. If you go to pay off your loan early, and that's when we used to find it out. That's how I found out about these is when we got payoffs for our loans. They will say, they will show this. And it's like, well, where did this extra interest rate come in? They can actually show this. Well, during the lifetime of the loan, this person was an ongoing, uh, you know, for, paid on the 14th of the month, ongoing, just enough to stay out of the penalty phase and, and be considered late according to us. But they also will charge you interest on there. So just be aware of that kind of stuff. But payment history is the first thing you got that they look at based on your scores how do you make your payments are you on time next thing is the types of credit okay um, there are things that are more favorable than others is it a store loan do you have like a you know jc pennies or, or something like that they're not typically our dillard's or macy's are one of those those are different types of loans than a visa or mastercard or even a car loan or another mortgage loan they're they 10 percent of what type of loan you have is based of your score is based on the type of loan do you have paid day loans. I mean, I've seen people that have those. And I'll tell you where a lot of that comes in too, is your, uh, is your ratios, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, in a minute here. But like, if you'll have a, um, a car or, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a payday loan, it might be for $200 ongoing, but you might just keep renewing that $200 a month. Well, that's looked at as you, you have a better chance of becoming late on that, which we kind of talked about that in the next 24 months. So that might reflect 10% of your score. 10% doesn't always look like much, but if you're the difference in, let's say, uh, you know, a, a 700 score or a 630, that can make all the difference on your interest rate and what you qualify for. Again, Another thing that you want to look at here is 10% new credit and inquiries. Okay, there's different kinds of inquiries. We'll start there. There's a hard inquiry and a soft inquiry. Now, one of the uh, the people we talked to about getting you pre-approved, they do soft inquiries until you're really ready to go through the underwriting process. Then they will do a hard inquiry. A soft inquiry does not show up on your credit report. Now, okay, it's, it is a, a, a snapshot and it looks at, it's kind of like what, Credit Karma and some of the other free uh, programs out there will do. You can look at those and they won't necessarily show up on your credit report as somebody that looked at it. Hard inquiries are when somebody actually does, when you're actually looking for credit, when you go for a loan, they're going to do a hard inquiry. When you actually come down to the underwriting process, they're going to do the tri-merge report, which we talked about. They're going to pull them up. It's going to show up. Yes, Bank of America pulled your credit or whoever it was. 
Okay. Um, you don't want to go around and get a bunch of inquiries. Now, nowadays, it's a little different than it used to be. They will give you a window. And it's typically only for mortgages and for cars, but they will give you a 30-day window. It used to be every time, and people did this because they check a few different sources, try to get better rates, <clears throat> but you might have five inquiries. Well, that doesn't seem like much, but that could be, goes back to your 10%. And 10% could make all the difference on the type of loan you get. But nowadays they do have a window. If they see five mortgage inquiries in a 30 month or 30 day period during the month, then they will not count that against you. Same thing with the car loans. Now, if you're one of them kind of people, and I've seen people do this too, that want to go out and shop for cars every month, that could be a deal. Okay, that could be a deal breaker and if you're buying the home, because that could be something they just see it's ongoing. Well, you have the you know tendency to be one of them kind of people. Well, maybe I'm always looking for stuff. Another thing is new credit. This typically does not help your credit score, and it could reflect it as much as 10% because you have a lot of new accounts. Seasoned accounts, the longer the better, okay? Um, on your payment history, you want to keep things for as long as possible, um, because the, the length of your accounts, and that's uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes, but you don't necessarily want to close your accounts as they get paid off for that reason. Because the longer you have accounts, the longer your payment history, the better off it is on your um, on your credit scores. Credit history, that's what we're just now talking about here, though. But the length of accounts, let's say, um, <clears throat> let's say you have a, a visa or, or something like that that you opened back, uh, you know. 10, 15 years ago, but you pay it off every month. But let's say that you want to switch and because you, you got a better rate, your situation's better. And this is this is something I've seen happen a lot over the years. Let's say you have a thousand dollar credit limit. You've used it. You've made your payments. You've established your credit, reestablished whatever your situation may be. But then again, you got offered another card for let's say twenty thousand dollars is your actual uh, limits, and you want to, and so you you transfer your balance, you pay it off. Transferring balance is where a lot of this comes in too. But then you want to go ahead and close your other account. You don't necessarily want to do that because that takes away your history. If you close a ten year credit history and then open it up with a new one, you potentially will not only lose the fifteen percent could be affected from your credit history, but you could also with your new account, there's another ten percent that may be adjusted there. So um, this could make all the difference on what type of loan or if you even get the loan. So that's something don't you don't have to necessarily use the old accounts, just don't necessarily close them. And again, this is done on an individual basis. You're going to have to look at your situation and talk to somebody that maybe either knows about it or find out yourself. Because the biggest thing is finding out yourself. And then this is this is one of the biggest ones I've seen over the years. And this is a huge percent, 30% is now this is a uh, mainly on your revolving accounts but this is the amount of your proportion of balance to limits and what what this me actually means is let's say you have a uh oh let's say you have a thousand just make it simple a thousand dollar uh a thousand dollar credit card limit okay and let's say you owe nine hundred dollars well you're at ninety percent of your proportion of balance to limits. That's a big red flag right there. It doesn't matter the dollar amount. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but it matters on the percentage. Okay, if you have $100 and, and you have a $1,000 limit, you're at 10%. So then it's looked at more favorably. This is something to keep in mind. This is also something if you're on a tight, um, if, you, if you're on a uh, real tight, you know, uh, debt to income ratio when it comes down to payments and things, you might be able to pay this down and wait a month or for them to re report this because these things adjust every month. That's the other thing to keep in mind is your scores can change. I've seen scores change as much as 150 points in one month. It's not typical, but it does. I've seen them go up. I've also seen them go down depending on what's, uh, what's reported. So that all is taken into consideration. So that's something to keep in mind with the about the amount of your uh, proportion of balance to limits that's a big chunk of your credit score on how it's determined so that's something to definitely keep in mind all right seven steps to uh to elevate your credit score and actually well, i say dominate your future because that's what this is this is ongoing these are things we go into a lot more detail in the book that i'm going to give you here but this these are some things that you want to know and again uh do, with what i uh 
you know, with one of my, my principles, keeping it simple, really simple. This is what we've uh, broke these down to. Number one, pay your bills on time. Seems very obvious. Again, we talked about the grace periods and some of that kind of stuff, but you want to pay your bills on time. Um, second thing, don't necessarily close olders and our paid off accounts. We just talked about that a little bit because your history uh, does make, make a difference. It does, um, it, it, it will be factored in and you can, you know, th this is stuff that, you know, with the new accounts, you don't want to necessarily open up, but this is something that makes a big difference on your personal situation. Again, these are all done individually. These, these things change. Uh, don't get unnecessary inquiries. We talked a little bit about that, about the windows that they do have on some of these these days, but don't just go out and get, um, you know, one of the things I, I used to see, and, and one of the things I, I'll just actually point out, but you, a lot of times you'll go to a soccer game or a football game or a baseball game or something like that, and then you'll have like a Bank of America might have a little thing out there where we're giving away umbrellas or blankets, stadium blankets, things like that. If you just see about getting an account, those are typically hard credit inquiries, and they will, whether whether you realize it or not, just to get your blanket, you may be getting one of them. I've seen people that actually went to them to uh, sporting events. Every time they went to a baseball game, they wanted to get another umbrella. So they kept getting it. Um, you know, they kept getting their credit, their credits uh, inquiries uh, just to apply for the account, whether you take the account or not, because people would say, oh, you don't have to take the account. And the people working at the booths would say that to you. Oh, you don't have to take the account. We're going to give you the free umbrella. Well, they get paid by the number of people that go through there. Well, you, you may be hurting yourself and that 10% that we just talked about could make all the difference of whether you get a favorable loan or even get the loan. So don't just necessarily get treat your credit like it's important because it is and it's done on an individual basis because nobody else cares but you And at the end of the day. I mean, this is all about you. So don't get unnecessary inquiries. Number four is keep your balance in, in proportion to your limits. Now, we typically say 30 to 40% or less. Less is more in this particular case. We talked about that. And this is this is so important. People don't realize this. Let's just say here's and here's a good example of how it works, because I've actually seen this. We talked about, let's say you have a uh, $1,000 Visa card with, you know, with a bank somewhere. And you and even though you make your payments on time, never missed it. You've had it for years, but you keep let's say you keep your balance at $900 a month. OK, you're at 90 percent. Your credit score is going to take a tremendous hit as far as what the, the number is on that, compared to somebody that let's say has a $100,000 limit and they owe $25,000. Of course, it's a lot more money than the 900, but you're 25%. That's way more favorable than being the nine, the 90%. So, and when they say 30 to 40, typically you, you want to have credit utilization. You don't really want something with a zero balance all the time. In fact, one of the ways you can establish credit if you have none or if you're reestablishing is to get yourself a thousand dollar card and then buy a, and you could even use your own money. One of the, one of the little keys that we used to use is, is go to your bank where you're at right now, put a thousand dollars in a savings account and have them open up a debit card. That's a Visa or MasterCard and reports every month, even though it's your own money that you're securing this visa or credit card, you know, with this our MasterCard, whatever it may be, even though it's your own money, they'll show utilization. Utilization is something you want because I've had many people over the years that had zero credit, but they, you know, because they've paid off all their stuff and they pay cash for everything. That is not necessarily good because you want to show utilization. So what we would do in that case is just buy one tank of gas a month. It used to be we'd say, yeah, you spend 20, 25 dollars. Now it might be a hundred dollars a month for the gas depending on what kind of uh, vehicle you have, but just show utilization and then pay it off. Or maybe you might want to just go out to eat and then pay that off, but just show utilization, but definitely keep your proportion of balanced limits intact. We say 30 or 40% or less, but I typically would say just keep it at 20% or less on the safe side. Cause a lot of things, a lot of things do show up. Number five, dispute any incorrect information. Um, this is something that, yeah, you're, there's there's mistakes on there. It's not as common as a lot of these credit doctors like you to believe, but there are some things that show up. Or you know, a lot of times you can dispute stuff that even if it is correct, it might be old. 
And see, anytime you dispute something, somebody will have to verify it and then pay a fee to keep it on there. So let's say you have an old collection that you did pay off. Let's say you had some medical bills and you had something on there, but you paid it off, but it still shows up on there. And let's say it is five or six years old. Typically things stay on there seven years and then 10% for things, I mean, 10 years for things like bankruptcies or if they renew them. And that's that's another story with that kind of stuff. But uh, but you can dispute this stuff. And even if it is correct, they can actually take this off. And a lot of times that can make the difference on your score because once that stuff's remo removed, it does not affect your score anymore. Uh, so that that's something that you can do. The other thing is to, and I'd like to point this out because a lot of people are not aware of this, but add a fraud and or any statement you want to your credit report. You can add up to 100 words. Actually, I believe it's 99 or less. And I didn't know that until, um, you know, I actually came across this from my personal situation. We've used this, I don't know how many times over the years, uh, because I got divorced many years ago and I got, to, you know, I was late on some payments on this. And we, we made them up. But then when I went to buy my house, this stuff was all showing up, you know, because it was with in the seven years, I didn't know I could dispute it and get it off there. But I added a uh, a statement on there just saying, hey, because of my divorce situation, I changed jobs. I mean, I had a lot of things going on. I got behind, but as you can see, I made them up. And I don't know if that made a big difference, but it was with an FHA loan and it probably did because they're not really based necessarily on credit scores when you go to FHA and some of the other programs. But that's something. Now, they can edit that also. I remember they took out the couple of things I put in there about devastating witches and stuff like like that, and, uh, maybe maybe I should have been a little more nicer to do. I didn't say nothing bad, but I mean they could they can do this stuff. But this could make all the difference. The other thing I like to point out here is the fraud statement. Okay, there's a lot of stuff about fraud these days, especially with the internet and all this kind of stuff. This is like the simplest thing to do. And it's very simple. In fact, I recommend this and I recommend you do this at least once a year when you check on your uh, on your report, because you really should monitor your own situation. But simply right on here and this is this right here, this little tip right here could make all the difference no matter what you end up doing going forward. But you just write on here. Uh, do not. And you put this on your credit report in your statement. You put, do not issue credit to anyone using the, my information here without a government, without obtaining a government issued state ID or passport or whatever. We kind of talked about that earlier and getting that stuff together. Make sure they show that and verification of calling me at this number. I used to use my home phone when I used to have a landline. Now we just put in there your cell phone. My banker used to, when I was buying investment properties, used to say, you know, you're a pain, John, because I got to call you now, wait till you get home after, you know, in the evening. I said, yeah, that's exactly why I do this though. Nobody can issue credit to anyone if you have this fraud statement on there. I don't care what the mother company's life load or some of those tell you, you pay our $30 a month and we'll do it for you. They don't monitor anything for you, honestly. They just, if something comes up, they have algorithms that show up. You do this yourself. Be proactive. Add that statement on there. If anyone gives credit to anybody, you have a right to sue them with no uh, no monetary limits, okay? You go sue them companies for a million dollars. You go sue them for $10 million. It doesn't make any difference. If you have that particular crowd fraud statement on your report, they cannot issue credit to anyone without a government issued ID and them calling you at whatever number you say. If they did not do those two things, and they because they have to prove that, if they cannot do that, then they are liable. This is how you eliminate fraud right here. Forget all that other stuff. This is how you do it. And the seventh step is self-monitor. You've got to pay attention to this kind of stuff yourself. Nobody else will do it for you. One of the biggest uh, things I've seen over the years is people don't look at their credit. They go try to apply for a loan and then they worry about their credit. You want to do this stuff up front. Get your pre-approval and see what you need to do to improve your situation. If you're not necessarily looking for a loan, you don't want to go do that right now. There are companies out there like Credit Karma and some of those. That's a good one to do because it doesn't count against you. Again, it's just kind of like a snapshot of what's being reported kind of in your area. It is not a tri-merge report. We've talked about the underwriting process and the things to get together uh, for your own 
personal situation, but self-monitor this stuff. Every year, uh, you know, they say you can get a free credit report. Uh, like I think it's freecreditreport.com, but they do not necessarily give you the numbers, your credit score though. And that's something that typically you're going to want to uh, want to know uh, when you, well, actually it's when you go for credit or apply for credit or loans and things like that, but do it yourself because um, nobody else is going to help you. You're going to need to do it yourself. That's one reason that, you know, like I said, I wrote the book, Secret Sales Credit Doctors Don't Want You to Know. And that's one reason I'm giving it to you today, because these things right here can help you no matter what you do, not only in buying your home, but just, just in everything. We talked about employers and things like that, but it will help you a lot with a lot of things. So those are the three essential steps to acquiring the home of your dreams. We talked about the neighborhood, money and the pre-approval um, process and some of the things you need to get together, including your credit and then the partners, the professional partners. Now, as our thank you uh, for joining us today in your gateway to profit sharing home buying mini workshop, uh, there's a couple things that I'll, I want to give to you. First of all, everybody that's here, we're going to, uh, we will give you a copy of the Profit Sharing Home Buying Mini Workshop slides, the ones I'm showing you right here with the pre-approval checklist. So you, if you were not, uh, you know, you're not a real diligent note taker or something like that, I'm going to give you the stuff you can get together. Again, only, and I, I highlighted that, only give uh, the stipulations and the things from your checklist of what they require. They may require you to get more things when you're getting your approved for your home. Uh, you know, your home loan, but just uh, give them only what they ask for. Um, if you would like to know more about our sweat equity uh, loan, a um, sweat equity land bank program we talked about a little bit, just request an application. I will send you one. We have a real short application. I can put you on the waiting list. We're still putting that together, but if you're a skilled labor or an unskilled labor, and you just like some credit for your diligence and your, your, the integrity of being a valuable person that you are uh, going and wanting to be part of this program, I'll send you a uh, application for that. If you, if you request it from me. Other things I talked about, I will give you the complimentary copy of Secrets Those Credit Doctors Don't Want You to Know that, um, that we have here. I will give you that automatically also so you can work on your credit. And that's an ongoing situation that you want to um, that you'll you'll want to continually monitor. And here's your request in case you don't have my email. This is the best one to use for me, the dealionaire at gmail.com. That'll be on your um, on the copy of your slides, too, that I'm going to send you. And then I do encourage you uh, to join us on our networking on Fridays. There's a group of, in, uh, of uh, members. We get together with the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Associate, Association members and guests. We typically have people from all over the country and all over the world. Um, easy, uh, there's an easy link to go to. You can just go to mine. I, I put the link to john.com. I got some free resources and stuff on there you can have, but it's also a link to our networking session. If you don't come, I know some of you, you do show up every week. I just do encourage you because that's where you'll find out stuff. It's a safe environment. You can find out on market, off market deals, if you got something to buy or sell, or if you just got questions, you may have a questions about a contractor or about where to get money or just what other people's experience is. That's how we, um, but that's how we grow. We all grow together by networking. So that's what I have. And I guess we'll open this up now for questions. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> 